1 Corinthians chapter 3 is where we're going to go. And we are going to consider today, kind of as a follow-up to the, the first Sunday of the year last week, the message on prayer that we had and on the harvest and whether we were loiterers or laborers. This week, we want to talk about the subject of failure. Because failure is something not discussed, but something that is a reality. And some of us are still trying to process 2018 struggles we've had, losses we've had, discouragements we've had. And there's no doubt that many of us will taste failure in 2019 in one way or another. So what is failure? Of course, it's easy to define. We all have been there before. It's a lack of success. It's a frustration. It's when something collapses. It could be a free fall a misfiring or a coming to nothing in your life. Now, we live in a society in 2019 where failure is simply not an option. We love to talk and boast about never failing. We always overcome failures not on the table, whether it's in business or in our personal lives. It is unacceptable. It is socially intolerable. We've set this standard against failure that is simply unrealistic and impossible. We have long left the world of Thomas Edison, who once said, I have not failed, I have just found 10,000 ways that don't work. Most of us today uh, are ashamed to even speak about our failures. But it hasn't always been this way. If you go back just a few generations, the world was an agrarian world. What I mean by that is we lived in agricultural societies. Yesterday, Samuel and I took a drive, and we were going east of here about an hour and a half. And we were in the middle of nowhere, somewhere, northwest Florida. It was an agricultural area. There wasn't much there at all. And in an agricultural society, people know that you can plow, you can plant, you can water, you can till, you can weed, you can fertilize. But at the end of the day, you have no power to make the plant grow. You have no power for fruit to come off the plant. You have no power to keep that plant alive. But in our modern world, it's not that way at all, is it? In our modern world, we are very formulatic. So what I mean by that is if I go into work and I punch the clock, I will get a paycheck at the end of the week, regardless of even really how my job performance is for most of us. For most of us, as long as I go to class and I resemble that I'm half awake, throughout the class, right, students, um, you'll probably get a half-decent grade at the end of the school year. And maybe as long as you just get through high school or you get through that class, you'll get a decent job one day. Or as long as you show up to practice and as long as you play on the team, regardless of how good your team is or is not, you'll probably get some sort of a ribbon or trophy or banner or certificate at the end of the season, regardless of your score. You see, the modern world has a different kind of theology than the ancient world and even the world of simply a few generations ago. Modernity in the modern world should not be summarized by the fact that we have plumbing and that we have electricity and that we have technology and gadgets and iPhones and smartphones and email. See, the, the modern world has removed God from the equation of day-to-day -day life, particularly his sovereignty his providence in our lives. And we have replaced God with a checklist. And if we do A, B, and C, D will always come. Failure will not be on the table. It will not be an option. I will always have success. Now, when we look at the Bible, this is simply not the case. You can plow the field. You can plant the seed. You can fertilize it. You can water it. But we must not forget, no matter how much sweat comes off our brow and how much energy we exert, God is sovereign over what comes out of the ground. God is sovereign over the results. And this can be a very scary thing. In fact, Winston Churchill, during the days of World War II, that great prime minister, said these words, something to consider today. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. Did you hear that? Success is not final. We live in a world that says that that is the goal. That is how things must end. But the reality is that is not a guarantee. And failure is not fatal. We will fail in 2019. Churchill said it is the courage to continue forward that counts in our walk. 
In fact, the Proverbs and throughout really the whole Bible, we are told over and over that the righteous can struggle, the righteous can fail, even on their, they can fall even on their faces. In fact, Proverbs 24, the righteous will fall seven times, which is just a, a summary number, like we're going to fail a lot in our lives, but we'll rise again. Failure is not fatal. We will rise again, but the wicked will stumble in the time of calamity. So in modern, the modern world we live in, productivity, efficiency are all engineered. It's all a process that makes us keep God out of the equation. And so when we do fail, we forget about God. We take all the blame on ourselves. And yet God is still in control of the world. So what I want to do today is help us to think through this idea of why did I fail? What is God trying to do through this failure? Because failure is not simply a statement that you weren't good enough, that you didn't have your act together, that you didn't try hard enough. There are times when you can do everything on the checklist and still taste the bitter cup of failure. And we need to ask God to help us to understand what he wants to do through our failure. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 10, may we hear God's word. Scripture says, who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are, listen to this, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me. As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. This is the word of the Lord. There was a major problem in the Corinthian church. One of these major problems, the sin problem, was that of factionalism. People were following individuals instead of keeping their eyes on Jesus Christ as the sovereign Lord who is in control of all failure or success. Cliques were forming in the church. Not that we would know anything about a clique in a church. So the idea here is that people would kind of get their friends, their close uh, familial relationships, and they would kind of ignore others, and they would kind of elevate themselves and put down others. And Paul will have none of this as we come into verse 5. He is saying here, look, I have served this church, Apollos have served this church, but who are we? Why are you putting so much attention on us? This is not our story. This is not our church. We might have been a part of the church. We might have been members of the church. We might have been leaders in the church. This is not our church. We are simply, now the New King James translates the word here, ministers. It is the Greek word diakonoi. It's the word for deacon, which again, deacon sounds very prestigious to some in 2019. The word simply means in the Greek language, a table waiter, a busboy, a server, a waiter, a waitress, if you will. So the idea here is not that this was someone who is domineering others, this is someone who is a servant to others, who cared about others, cared about their lives, cared about what they were going through. Look, the church is never to be a place where one program is more important than another program, or one person is more impor important than another person. And he's making this very clear here. We are not to idolize individuals. Now, this is very dangerous for us in 2019 because we set people on pedestals all the time. And we think if we can just engineer, read the right book, have the right formula, do the right work, we will always get success. And so they're saying, look, we are not the reason why this church is where it is. Our programs, our teaching, our work is not the reason why this church is where it is. And I want you to hear today that we live in this same kind of culture that the Corinth church was struggling with, the celebrity culture. I mean, think of our television shows, American Idol, Dancing with the Stars, America's Got Talent, or look at our sports teams and the way players 
and celebrities are idolized. We struggle with elevating people on pedestals. I read a recent study. It said, quote, a ridiculous 51% of 18 to 25-year-olds think they will be famous one day. I want you to hear that again. 51% of 18 to 25-year-olds surveyed believe they will be famous one day. But it starts even younger than that. When parents ask their children as young as five years old, this was a few years back, two years back, what they wanted to be when they grew up, 19% of five-year-olds said they wanted to be famous. They wanted to be famous at five. You see, we live in a world where we want to be elevated, where it's our story, where my life counts, where uh, failure is not on the table. I will be somebody great one day. And I fear in the church we have bought into this narrative, this idea that it's okay to be a nobody. It's okay to not have the world revolve around you. In fact, our theology teaches it does not revolve around you at all. Another recent statistic you see on the screen, this is pretty interesting. There is a 0.0296% chance your child will become a professional athlete one day. How many parents that have kids in sports live like that? Just sit on the sidelines and listen to the banter, and you'll know very quickly that's not the case, is it? Yet we, we build into our kids from little on up how great they will be and how they will take the world on by storm and how they will not fail and they will not face failure. But yet there is a 100% chance they will face Jesus one day. And I think it's more important where they stand before him than where they stand before the world. Amen? Much higher percentage there. Now, when Paul is saying this, he is saying exactly what Jesus said in his teaching in Luke 17, 10, where there the servant said simply, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Don't glorify us, glorify the master. So now look how this plays out in the next verse, in verse 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Read it with me again. I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. Paul is looking at the church. He's looking at the world as a field. You see that in verse 9. The world is a field. The church, the people in the church are a field. And we have here this agricultural reference that most of us don't understand anymore today. But this is going to help us understand failure and success and who we should idolize, who we should really set our focus, our attention, and our emotions and affections on. So the farmer goes out and he plants seeds. And he, he plows, he tills the ground, he breaks up the rocks, he breaks up the soil. And then the farmer's co-worker comes in and he waters the field, especially if there's no rain. He fertilizes it. He pulls out the weeds. He cultivates the field. But that's all you and I can do, right? We can't control the weather, regardless of what conspiracy theory says that the government is currently controlling the weather. I promise you they're not. All right? They didn't send the hurricane. Um, we can't control what that seed does, if it will have life come out of it or not. And we can get the seed, and we can get it pretty tall into a healthy-looking plant, and we can't control whether fruit ever comes out of it or not. You see, Paul says, I planted. Paul was the missionary who went to this pagan city of Corinth, and he invested. We're told in Acts 18, he gave 18 months of his life, a year and a half, in these people. And he planted the gospel. He was the first one to break the hard ground. Our friend, Pastor Ryan Melson, who serves on the West Bank of New Orleans, we prayed for him this morning. He says that he plows concrete on a daily basis when he plows in, on the outskirts of New Orleans. But the reality is all of our hearts are just as hard. Whether you live in New Orleans or you live in Pensacola, we're all dead in our sin without Christ. Our hearts are hard. Paul was the first one. I want to stop for a minute here. 18 months he spent, he gave to this church. And I want to ask you, who is planted in your life? Who is the first one that planted the gospel? Who shared the gospel? Was it a parent? Was it a pastor? Was it a co-worker? Was it a schoolmate? Was it a neighbor? Who was the first one that introduced you to Jesus and his love? I know some of us here grew up in the church, but that's not the luxury all of us have had. And if you did grow up in the church, was it a parent? Was it a small group teacher? Who was it? And then I want to flip the question on you and say, who are you planning in? 
Who are you planting in? Because that is what we're called to do. If you're a parent, you've got some built-in plants in your house that you're supposed to be sowing some seed into. If you've got neighbors, you've got some people that God's gave you that you're supposed to be planting into. If you work at a job and people come in and out every day, you got the mission field right in front of you. There are people in all of our lives that we are responsible to plant the gospel into them. To, to work in the hard ground, whether it's concrete in New Orleans or whether it's in Beulah Dirt, out this way west, all right? You got to be planning. But that's not all. Notice it says next in this verse, Apollos watered. So Apollos comes in Acts chapter 19, verse 1, after Paul leaves Corinth, after 18 months of ministering, Apollos, who's a, a missionary, a preacher from Alexandria, he shows up and he takes over where Paul left off. And he begins to water into these people to help the crop grow. Let me ask you, who watered into your life? Can you think in your life, as you've grown as a Christian, who are the people who have spent time on you after you receive Christ as Lord? Who are the people who taught you? Who are the people who encouraged you, who prayed for you, who were there for you, who poured the living water of Jesus Christ into your very soul? Now, not the best farmer nor the, the greatest horticulturist who has a degree in this can give physical life or growth to a plant. And it's interesting, in the Greek language, the verbs here are very particular. I planted, Paul says, Apollos watered. These are both in what's called the aorist tense. At a point of time, 18 months, Paul worked there in that church. And then Apollos came at a point of time. But I want you to notice it says next, but God, but God gave the increase. That is an imperfect verb, meaning it was God who did this and he didn't do it one time. He did it long term in their lives. Now, we can do all the work. We can hit the punch list. We can go through the checklist and we can do everything. And at the end of the day, Paul is reminding us, it is not up to us whose heart gets changed. It's not up to us how this church will look in five years from now or five months from now or five days from now. It's not up to us what our children are going to look like in 10 years. We have a job to do. We have plowing and we have watering and we have fertilizing. We have planning. We, we have prayer and all these things. But ultimately, this is not in our hands. So I want to stop for a minute here and say that many of us have just went through a lot of failure, a lot of struggle, and there's a lot of things in our lives that we've got to slow down and recognize, I don't care how strong you are, how smart you are, what degree you have, how much experience you have, there's certain things that you can only go so far on. I mean, let's start with our children, right? You can sow into your children, you can love your children, you can plow into your children, and then you can look 10 years from now, and some of us, some of our kids are going to be running from God. Some of them are really going to be struggling. Does that mean you're a failure? Does that mean that you didn't pray enough, that you didn't invest in them enough, you didn't love them enough? Does it mean God's done with the story yet? You may have plowed and someone else might have watered, but God's not done in the story, right? God gave the increases in an imperfect verb, meaning as long as they're alive and breathing, God's in the equation. He's in the story. It's not over yet. The book's not closed yet. Someone needs hope today because some of you are beating yourself up today over children that are running from God when really, instead of beating yourself, take that energy praying to God and watering and plowing. What about business? Some of you have, are, are just great business people. You're gifted at this. You touch it. I mean, I want you to come grow some plants in my backyard because when you touch it, it's going to prosper. You're wise. But all of a sudden, you make that one bad business deal. You invest in the wrong employee. You invest in the wrong person. And all of a sudden, you have a dramatic decline. All of a sudden, you can go from being on the top to on the bottom overnight. That happened a few years back with the stock market. Uh, the stock market. I remember sitting with a guy right after that happened in his office, and he told me he lost $150,000 in just a couple days when that crash happened. $150,000 like that. I want to say to you, friends, that um, just because you run your business right is no guarantee that you're going to be 
the most successful person. You're going to be the most financially prosperous. It's not a guarantee of that. And God does not hold you responsible for whether you're rich or whether you're poor. That's not what's important in this passage. It's not what brings happiness either. Again, the church. Who are we going to be as a church in 2019? What kind of a church are we going to be? What kind of a church are we going to look like? Who are we going to reach? We cannot just sit back and say, well, God is sovereign, so you know, we're just going to do our thing. No, God's called us to plow. God's called us to water. God's called us to fertilize. God's called us to open our mouths and share. God's called us to open our hands and open our hearts and love. But ultimately, I can't change your heart, and you can't change their heart, but God can. God can. What about marriages, right? What about marriages that are grinding up against each other right now? If you don't know what I mean, you haven't been married long enough, all right? Marriages that there is, uh, you know, you go to the justice of the peace to get married, and right after that, the war begins. It's like, what just happened here? Is there hope? There's hope in God. But you got to plant, you got to water. Look, God doesn't make it just grow on its own. He uses us. He's chosen to bring us into the equation. You've got to plow, you've got to plant, you've got to water. But ultimately, sometimes God doesn't give the increase. Some of us know that. We've went through divorces. We've went through failed relationships. Does that mean that you're 100% at fault? Sometimes we're at fault, but that doesn't mean that it's all on you, is it? Because there's a sovereign God involved in the equation who's merciful and forgiving and restoring and a helper in our time of need and a refuge when the, the storm is blowing. I mean, you know, you want to you talk about a storm blowing? Think about the hurricane that hit Panama City not too long ago. That's what I'm talking about in your marriage, a storm blowing. And God is sovereign. And whatever happens when the storm stops, God will still be there. He will still be there. So Paul's saying, don't honor the artist. Don't make a statue of the brush or of the palette. Honor the God who is the one who gives success and who gives failure. And he's going to do something through it. This is what we call the sovereignty of God, the providence of God, that God is in control and involved in every drop, every second of our lives. He doesn't forget about us. He isn't forgotten you today. Spurgeon said it this way. He said, there is no attribute more comforting to God's children than God's sovereignty. Under the hardest, hardest adverse circumstances, in the most severe trials, they believe that sovereignty has ordained our afflictions, that God's sovereignty overrules us, and that his sovereignty will sanctify us. It will make us holy. It will draw us closer to him. There is nothing for which God's children ought to more earnestly contend for, defend, than the doctrine of God being the master over all the world. The kingship of God over all the works of his hands. The throne of God in his right to sit upon that throne. For it is God upon the throne upon whom we trust. Some of you in this room today are really frustrated because you don't want to water, you want to plant. Some of you are angry because you don't want to plow, you want to water. Most of us are angry because we just want to eat the fruit and do no work at all. But real fruitfulness in life happens when we are peacefully content to do whatever God has called us to do, to do the right thing and leave the results to God in His goodness. Will not the judge of the earth do what is right? Verse 7 says, So then he who plants, he's nothing. Nor he who waters is anything. We should not be quarreling. It's absurd. It's God that matters. Soli Deo Gloria. Glory to God alone. It's not my church. It's not your church. It's God's church. The power is not in your slick presentation. The power is not in your business acumen. The power is not simply in how many outings you take your kids on. The power is in God and His Word. My labors are nothing without God. Remember Matthew 19, 26, when the disciples were so downcast and they were like, God, who can be saved? 
Jesus said, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. It is only God who causes the increase. It's not you, it's not me. Sometimes we will fail in life. And God wants to do something through that. Don't waste your failure. Don't waste it. Paul Harvey told a remarkable story of God's sovereignty, his providence in our lives. He told a story about how during World War II, over a thousand of the Allied prisoners, many from the United States, uh, many of whom were Christians, were uh, taken captive. And one of America's mighty bombers had taken off from the island of Guam, and it was headed for Kokora, Japan. I hope I pronounced that island right, or that place right, with a deadly cargo. And as this bomber is flying over the water and is getting to this place in Japan, clouds covered the target area, very thick clouds. So the B-29 circled for nearly an hour over it until its fuel supply reached a critical place. And, and the, the pilot and the people that had sent him on this, mess, this mission were highly frustrated and disappointed because this, there was a lot riding on this mission. And so they were not able to fulfill this, and they had to change course. They were very upset about this. They had failed in the mission that they wanted to do. Well, sometime later, an officer received some startling intelligence. You see, just one week before that bombing mission, the Japanese had transferred one of their largest concentrations of captured Americans to the city of Kokora. And upon reading this, the officer exclaimed, thank God for, for sending us the cloud. Thank God for sending us the cloud. If the city hadn't been hidden from the bomber, a thousand soldiers, most Americans, many Christians, would have been destroyed in that attack. You see, sometimes we think we have failed, but God is actually doing something that we can't see. Something we're not aware of. Now he who plants, verse 8, look with me there. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building according to the grace of God. I mean, can you not hear over and over? You are God's. It is God's field, God's building, God's workers. The, the sovereignty of God is the point of this. You can't change their heart. You can't change the future. But God is sovereign over it. He's not failing you. He hasn't forgotten you. When you're tasting failure and it's bitter, it may be that the clouds are there and the storm is brewing because of what God is doing. He's got a bigger plan than your mission you were on, you thought was so important. He's doing something greater like that pilot who thought his mission was so important until he realized a thousand lives would have been taken had he completed it. He had to fail for that thousand. Each one will receive according to his own labor. Notice it's not according to the harvest. You don't get because of how much success you have. On the day of judgment, when we stand before Christ, he's not going to judge you based on the size of how large your church was or how many lives you change because you don't change anybody's life. He will, however, say, were you faithful? Were you faithful? Did you plow? Did you fertilize? Did you water? Did you stay faithful when the ground was dry and there was a drought when the plant started to wither and the fruit was scarce, did you stay faithful? That's what this is about. I've heard of stories of missionaries laboring for 40 years or, or men like William Carey, not one convert in India. I believe seven or eight years he was there until he got his first convert, a Hindu man named Krishna Pal. Were those first seven years a failure or was God preparing him for thousands that were going to come? Think about Jeremiah, the great faithful prophet of God who labored so many years with very little visible result, ridiculed, persecuted, rejected. And yet you've got another missionary, a miserable missionary named Jonah, who does everything against what God says, and yet God chooses to convert an entire pagan city through his ministry from just a few days of serving. God's in charge. And God rewards faithfulness. We are God's. The church belongs to God. Your children belong to God. Your spouse belongs to God. Your neighbors belong to God. The heart is in the hand of the Lord. 
not in mine. He is the wise master builder. We read Deuteronomy 8 earlier today, and I want us to just think about a few of those verses again. You see, in the Old Testament, God had blessed Israel mightily. God had gave them so much when they entered the land. But there was a danger in their success to forget God. In fact, when the pilgrims came to this country, Cotton Mather made this statement a few generations after the first pilgrims. He said, they came into this country and religion begot prosperity. The strong Christian faith of the pilgrims brought the blessing of God on the nation. And then he said, the daughter devoured the mother. The prosperity devoured the religion. In other words, it is easy for us in our success to forget God. To forget he's the one behind it all. Look at these words. He says, you will eat and be full when you come into the land. And the Lord will bless you for the good land he has given you. Israel deserved to still be back in Egypt. If you don't believe me, go read Exodus. Some of us deserve to still be stuck in Egypt. But God chose to produce this kind of fruit. But look what he says in verse 11 on the screen. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and you have built good houses and you live them and you have herds and flocks and they multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied, your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God. Beware, beware church, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. There is a temptation to forget God in 2019. We live in a modern world. You flip the switch and you have light. You charge your iPhone and you say, hey Siri or hey Google, and it tells you the answer. You use indoor plumbing and you flush and it works. You have electricity. The temptation is to, to live so easily in our modern conveniences and forget God. The farmer didn't forget God, but many of us do. Look, we live as if we're not dependent on the weather, right? If we're not dependent on the soil, if we're not dependent on the water, if we're not dependent on the God who gives life. And then all of a sudden, God intervenes and he says, no, nope, this time there's not going to be success. Listen to this. This is the crux of this. This time there's going to be failure. This time it's not going to work out like you thought it was. This time the formula is not going to compute. This time things are going to crash. You're going to start to enter free fall. This time your, your checkbook is not going to balance. This time your kids are going to say no when you expected them to say yes. This time your neighbor is going to reject you. This time the church is going to be empty on Sunday morning. Which, by the way, we've been struggling with that lately, right? This time... My prayers are going to get a big fat no or later from God, not a yes when I ask for them. You see, and all of a sudden stuff starts to fall, stuff starts to crash, things start to get hard, things start to get dark. Like that, we sang some songs today, He Gives and Takes Away. We sang, when darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. It happens sometimes, darkness begins to get in our face, and, and he takes away from us, and we're hurting. Look, when the military, when this happens in the military, when the Navy SEALs, they get a warning, right? At uh, 0600 hours, you're going to be on the helicopter, you're going to be jumping out of it, and you're going to be giving this much time to go through hell on earth, but you're going to complete your mission and come home. They get a warning, they know how long approximately, but as Christians, sometimes we get no warning, all of a sudden, things go bad. Things get hard. We begin to suffer. Thomas Watson said these words. Please hear them. He said, The fire burns hottest in the coldest climate. God often turns the sins of others to our good. And he makes our maladies, our sickness, our medicine. The consideration that all of God's working, his providences, no matter how cross, how hard they are, how bloody they are, they will do a believer good because we know all things work together for good to those who love God. Our malady can become our medicine. God may want to do something through our failure, through our lack of fruit, through our lack of growth. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you have a guarantee you're not going to fail. Proof of that, Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. 
for 33 years. He never once sinned. He did everything by the book. He lived the perfect righteous life. He kept the law of God perfectly. And yet he suffered the most unjust death ever on the cross. As his hands and feet will nail to it. And he was exposed to the, 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 the whip and the crown of thorns, and as he suffered the wrath of God. What do you do when you free fall? What do you do when you fail? What do you do when God takes away? What do you do when God does not give the increase this time? When there is no rain, when there is no life. Friends, there is no comfort sometimes in these days until you hit the bottom. And as old Spurgeon said, when you hit the bottom, that's when you might run into the rock of ages. Who's going to be our help. So I want to give you three closing points very quickly. What do you do? How does God use this failure? Number one, the verses are on the screen. I hope you write them down and you meditate on them this week. Galatians 6, 2. Notice it does not say, bear one another's blessings and fulfill the law of Christ. Why doesn't he command us that? It's easy to do that. It's easy to be there when, it's, when everyone likes one another. It's easy to be there when there's no struggles. It's easy to be there when everyone's talking nice. But it says bear one another's burdens. We are to be a refuge for the suffering. When there is a cut, we apply the bandage. When someone is down, we help lift them up. When they are needy, we encourage them. We come alongside to help them. Suffering equips us to have the heart of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. When there is loss and failure, this is a time for us to get closer together than ever before. Not to get farther away from one another. Stop trying to bear one another's blessings. That's way too easy. Look around and bear one another's burdens. Secondly, firsthand experience in suffering is essential for growth in life. Again, what did Thomas Edison say, that great theologian? I have not failed. I have just found 10,000 ways that don't work. <laughs> Suffering firsthand equips us for ministry and life. Paul said God comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in an affliction with the same comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. When you have passed through the fiery trial and found God faithful when everyone else was not faithful, now you can go help someone else where everyone else has not been faithful, but God can be. Don't waste your failure. Realize God is forming you and preparing you to help somebody else. And lastly, where we, where we left off last week, prayer and fasting. We're in 40 days of prayer. And pray, when we pray, we are saying we are not dependent on ourselves. We are dependent on a sovereign God. It's a, it's a slap into the face of our pride and our self-sufficiency. What did we study last week? Pray to the Lord of the harvest. That he would send out laborers into the harvest. You can't do the harvest, but you can pray. And praying is a big part of the work. Fasting is when you're at the end of the rope. At the end of yourself, you have this burden of the soul. You're at the bottom and you've failed. And now you realize you've come to the end of yourself and it's all of God. It's all of God. During a great time of drought in Scotland, the very famous preacher, the Reverend Dr. Thomas Guthrie, prayed fervently in his church on a Sunday morning because drought was affecting his agricultural community. And he prayed and he prayed the power of God down for there to be rain and the drought to end. And then they went home from service. And as they were about to go back for the evening service, his daughter Mary stopped the Reverend Dr. Guthrie, also known as dad to her, as he was about to walk out the door to go back to church. And she said, Papa, here's the umbrella. And he asked, what do we need it for? And she said, Dad, you prayed for rain this morning, and don't you expect that God will send it? Don't you expect that God will send it? Prayer is the work that God calls us to in our failure. Let's pray.